Let us listen to our passages of Scripture from the Message Bible. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you will ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. You can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of how to compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. And then later in Matthew, in the 18th chapter, verses 12 through 18, we have this. Look at it this way. If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, doesn't he leave the ninety and nine and go after the one? And if he finds it, doesn't he make far more over it than over the ninety-nine who stay put? Your father in heaven feels the same way. He doesn't want to lose even one of these simple believers. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you have to start over from scratch. Confront him with the need for repentance and offer again God's forgiving love. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I will be there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, I am so grateful to be here this Sunday, and I want to preface this sermon with, because uh, uh, every time you preach on the text we're going to preach today, I said this in Bible study, I'll say it again. Uh, if this sermon is, you think it's about you, it probably is. 
but that doesn't mean I intended it to be that. It may be God who's intending it to be that. I am not talking about anybody, and yet I'm talking about everybody. Because that's what the scripture in the word does. When we started, two months ago, we handed in the theme for this month, which was about conflict and mercy. Two months ago. And almost every Sunday we've come here and there have been times where we've been looking at violence happening in America and in our country. This last week I've been thinking about Sister Melba, who in Arkansas now, they've just signed the governor of Arkansas in her infinite and smallness, signed a bill that says we will no longer recognize the importance of her struggle, the importance of black history, the importance of what she did. And then I saw where well, that school said, it doesn't matter whether you recognize it, we are gonna teach it anyway, amen? But I think what it, what it must be like in your lifetime to have given so much to advance our humanity, and to watch what the backlash is of it right now. Even before yesterday, I was thinking about all of the pain and the anger and the violence that have been going on in this country. Teresa, uh, when I talked to her and we were dealing with what was happening with her, she talked about why is everybody so angry? Even in an emergency room when folk were supposed to be helping me, they just seemed to be angry. Yeah, but doesn't it feel that way? The, the notion of contention has arisen around us to a level that is surprising right now. Anger of such a level, of such dimension, of such pain at this moment. Is something that we all feel in our bones. And then almost yesterday when in Jacksonville, you saw the racist manifesto being written and the guy going into the dollar store only because he didn't get to Edward Waters College, which is right down the street, which would have been even more people. And he takes a gun in which there is a swastika on it. And he shoots people because of the color of their skin. I think about what's going on in, in the media right now. Well, people are profoundly small in the thing that could make them so much larger. But then I remember this book of Matthew. Matthew is a gospel that was written at an important time in the history. It is not the first, just because it appears to be the first and not the gospel, it isn't. It's actually one of the latest gospels. And it is written to people who are in, already in a community. Because the times when things are changing, people get weird. When they no longer feel like they're in control, when things are changing, when folks can't understand what's going on, when things that used to be no longer seems to be the way they were before, people get angry. They get mean because community is based upon us all agreeing on certain things. And there is this weird thing that happens. Oh, you see it. <laughs> oh, God, you see it. People going, the good old days. <laughs> good old days for who? Not the good old days for women who couldn't vote. <laughs> good old days. Certainly not the good old days for African Americans. I don't want to go back to the good old days of slavery. The good old days. Not the good old days for those who had no unions and when, when children used to work their bones and die in factory. The good old days. Oh, what they're saying is, they, they, what they're saying is somehow there is this history that used to be wonderful and amazing and suddenly, the good old days, we could just get back to the good old days. They were neither good nor are they old. 
They weren't good for everybody. And they're not old because they're happening right now. Because the reality is, quite frankly, folk, that we as a people always have a choice. And the question is, what are you doing in this day? For this day is determining what the good old days are. Look at Matthew. Unlike the other passages, it does not start. If you look at Luke, the only other place in the birth story, it starts with Abraham. <laughs> but not Matthew. He starts with people. And he starts with 14 generations to 14 generations to 14 generations. Then you have Jesus. As if to say, Jesus doesn't come apart from the human experience. Jesus comes through the human experience. Oh, oh, see, y'all ain't getting this right now. So let me make it very clear and very plain that, that Jesus is not something that is apart from you. If you say you are standing up for Jesus and every time you come in the room, you bring strife. It doesn't matter what you say. You are not a representative of Jesus. If every time somebody looks at you and you come in with your born again, do right mind, going to throw the cross on them and wearing your t-shirt to say God is, but then they feel worse because you are, you are not representing Jesus. Jesus comes through the, what the human experience is. It is that 14 generations that says that in effect who Jesus is is how you live and the choices you make. 14 generations, so Matthew begins to talk about the reality to his community. Things are changing, and the more they change, the more they're the same. What do I mean by that? There's this myth. When you look back in history, and you say, you know, that's just the way things were then. People couldn't have done anything more. That's just their product of their time. Not really. There were people who lived in those times who made different choices, and because of their choices, that's how we are right now. Product of their time. There were black preachers all over Atlanta who told Martin Luther King, boy, you better sit down. Product of their time. And let's be very clear. Changes don't happen unless women misbehave and not a product of their time. Because they always tell the women, oh, that's not your place. And it's only women that says, no, nah, I didn't ask you where my place is. I am in the place God put me. So there is always in every generation people who decide I've got a different choice. That's why you see in Matthew the notion that Faith is about the bringing of another kingdom. Peace and justice is not something that happens because God imposes it. I'm going to say that again. It's not something that happens because if we pray hard enough, our thoughts and prayers. If we, if we just, you know, if, if, we, we, if we all get together around a flagpole, I know I ain't against that, but you know. <laughs> but if that's your only plan, that's not enough. Let me be very clear. And so it's all about that. That is not how peace happens. Peace happens when we realize that the, that the God we serve is working on us so much so that we now have a strength that we didn't used to have so that we can do things we didn't used to do. Let me break this down some more. Why do you think God works so hard at delivering us from our own prejudices? Why do you think the spirit of the living God works so hard at making us love folk who, quite frankly, we don't really want to love? I, I, I know y'all want to love everybody. Some folk come like, I really don't want, you know, and then I find myself going, oh, shoot. You know what I mean? Because something within me makes me do it. All of that is because we are being transformed into new creatures. So in the 18th chapter where we're at right now in this verse, that's why I, I, want, I want to stop. That's why, I, that's why I had you read the Beatitude from the, from, the, from the Message Bible. Because it says sometimes the things that you thought were your bad days were your best days. The times when you thought you were out of control is the time that you found out that God was showing you who was in control. 
The times when you thought that you are hard to care and you found out people cared for you is when you got the debt of gratitude that you're now paying now. A half the reason I'm helping somebody is because somebody helped me. You understand that the vision of who we become, the vision of what we do is not from our best days, but our most vulnerable days. The reason there are those of us who work in the food bank, some of us, is because we know what it's like to be hungry. And those were hard days, but now you're helping somebody else through. The reason that you, are, you, you forgive somebody who done some things is because you remember you did the same thing. God save us from self-righteous folk who are running away from their worst days. That's why they never became their best person. That's right. I know they're, these are the folk online. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> these are the folk that's not in church today. You know, these folk who say, I've never, I, 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 because I got saved, <laughs> I will forget about everything that got me there. That's what Matthew is saying. No, you are blessed before, now, and after. You have been blessed when you were acting up. You have been blessed when you were high as a kite. Hello. You have been blessed when you hurt people because you got through it and you learned something from it. And because of that, you are now loving somebody in a different way. That's why then in Matthew, the 18th chapter, it begins with Jesus saying to folk, with, with disciples go, hey, hey, Jesus, who is the greatest disciple? Who is the greatest among them? Right? Read that 18th chapter. We did it in Bible study. It starts off with, who the greatest? And the first thing he says is, who the greatest is someone who's like a child. I lean in close to the computer screen. And listen here, closely here. Arrogant people are not people that God can use. People who believe that they're all that in a bag of chips, you may not know that, that phrase, all that in a bag of chips. People who believe stuff don't stink, y'all don't know that either. But people who believe that they're all of that usually can't be used by the Lord. But this chapter make it very clear, you can't be used, if you wanna be great, you've got to embrace humility. Come as a child, come as a child, come as a child, come as somebody who like, I ain't got it all together. I've messed up. And because when you're God's child, God takes care of you. One of the problems is you trying to take care of yourself and taking care of yourself and being angry at your others is because you can't take care of yourself. I'm sorry. You, your one vote can't change everything. I know, but it is something you have to do because God can use your one vote to change something. But if you're just angry about who you not, you'll never be able to use what God has. I am sick and tired of folks saying, well, things ain't gonna change anyhow. Well, if you believe that, <laughs> You're right, it won't change. And if you believe it's in your hand, then you don't know the God I know. Because the God I know says, if you'll just simply give yourself over to me and move out of the gratitude of your heart, things will change because God will change the world through you. How many sitting here look back and go, if I had dreamed about what God was going to do in my life, I would have never dreamed this dream. If I had thought and planned, in fact, I did, and I completely messed up the plan. And now look what God is doing, and people come to you and say to you, wow, what you said, what you did, what you're doing changes my life. And you're looking like me, I'm only me because that's what humility does. And when you humble yourself before the Lord, 
You become the child of God, and guess what? You don't have to defend yourself no more because God said that's my child. When you lay down your weapons, God picks up. <laughs> because one of the problems, if you want to keep on trying to fight your own battle, Holy Spirit will say, go ahead, take a shot. See what happens. <laughs> That's why some folks are still in the same problems that they have having all the time. Because they didn't lay down their lives for the Lord. I, I, I told you I'm thinking about Miss Melbourne. I'm thinking about the movements. There. I mean, think about it, folk. A whole bunch of folk thought that they could march and change the world. March? <laughs> what a crazy thing to do. <laughs> but they laid down like a child and God didn't use this and magnifies that. I just, the problem isn't that we don't have the same God. We just don't have the same kind of people with the same kind of commitment. Because ultimately speaking, to be humble, the second thing he says is to also regard people as important. I'm going to say that again. One of the things that we don't do is that we don't regard the person that we're in a disagreement with, or we don't regard the people that we actually have not been nice to us. We don't regard them with any value whatsoever. And I'm going to tell you right now, from experience, if I know you don't like me no matter what, I ain't going to try to be different either, because at least I'll be happy, right? right? I mean, I mean I, why, why try? You know, this is, this is one of the dangers of reality, of when we're doing that. And I, I look at people politically in this country, and I look at people who are socially in this country, and I hear the preachers of the past trying to tell us, we got to love one another. And now we look at it in cynicism, and we say, no, we don't. We have to stand up for our own rights, and we have to... I have to be careful to stand just for us. I know it makes sense. It just ain't working. What is working is you love somebody enough to say, I'm going to believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And you know what? I'm going to say and do what God calls me to say and do what call, God calls me to do and remind you who you are because you're one of the 99 that's left, but I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get your misogynistic, homophobic, crazy self. I'm coming to get your politically crazy. I'm coming to get your... Only America is great and no other country. I'm coming to get you because that's not what you're supposed to be and that's not what you were born to be. Be very clear. You were born in the image of God. Be very clear. Somebody had to teach you how to hate. I don't believe, see, I'm trying not to be political yet being political. You know, I'm, I'm rather than that line. Because now that we're online, I know that they okay, you, you know, cut things out. And but so I got to be real careful here. But I, I know you weren't born with a certain hat on, if you know what I'm saying. Somebody had to put that hat on your head. I, I know you weren't born just being afraid of people who were different from you. Somebody, some family had to teach that to you. I know you weren't a born with somebody with being afraid of people having more than you because you didn't check a three-year-old does not check another three-year-old bank account and say are you a my, part of my class that's something somebody taught you and if someone taught you that then quite frankly we will come at you and remind you that's not who you are you're not mean you're just acting mean you know what you know what? The God I know and the God I serve values you. And even though I don't like you, I value you. And I'm going out of my way to bring you back to the place because this sermon is called Peacekeeper. Because I am called to be a peacekeeper. But it has to change the atmosphere. It can't be done alone. We all who are in this church online and churches around the country, we all can create a movement of peace. Well, that's a good part. Now I'm about, I'm about to meddle now. 
The last thing it talks about is how do you live this thing out personally? Look at the person on the left and say, uh oh, you bought the medal. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Until somebody is on your last nerve. And somebody individually, you know what I'm saying? Come up to you. And if you look on that scripture, it says, and sin, but not against God. Because, you know, God really ain't surprised about our little sinful thing, because that's kind of what we do. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's like what, what I, what, the, 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 I, I love parents who are in school who know their child. And, and you call some parents, I've, I've worked in school system before, you saw come some, some parents and they go, oh, Johnny would never do that. You call other parents, they go, oh, yeah, there he go again. I mean, they, they just know I got one of them children. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, ooh, yeah, yeah. The phone rings, and even before they pick it up, they go, oh, dog, I know. I sent him to school again. I know he messed up. Okay, yes. You know what I'm saying? So God's like the latter than the former. God is not surprised that we mess up and not offended. But we are when other folks step to us. Now the question is, conflict is a part of community. It's a part, we've just talked about macro conflicts. I'm coming at you, I'm gonna be who I am, I'm gonna believe you, I'm gonna stand courageously, and I'm gonna believe with humility that God's gonna change things and I'm gonna change you. Now what do you do on the individual level? When conflict comes, the first thing you do is not avoid it. I won't say that again. Can anybody, this is my own. <laughs> the Bible says you go to them. That means you ain't waiting for other folk. You ain't waiting, to, waiting till they realize it. I hope they can just see what they're doing. They can't. When you think, don't people, don't, doesn't he or she see themselves? Newsflash, they don't. Sorry. But how can they? I don't know, but they don't. Everybody else can see it. I know, but they don't. It's like a neon light. They blind. Okay? Just accept that. Look at folks and say, I don't know. Because quite frankly, here's the clock. There are faces in your life where you are also like them. Ooh, you didn't see that one coming. That slipped down in the bottom, did you? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> they don't. And so if we're trying to create an atmosphere of peace, excuse me, if we're trying to create an atmosphere of peace, that means we have to take responsibility to go to them. And the Bible says, and say, look here now, this is what's going on. And see, I love the Bible. It is so honest. Because if it was written by one of our psychologists today, it would have said that when you go to somebody and tell them the truth, they'd be happy. We know they ain't. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. But your reaction does not change your commitment to the truth, to talking to them. Because you know why? I'm not going to sit in offense and let me become more angry and more offended while I am mad at you. Now you've infected me. I told you I'm coming at you. You ain't coming at me. I'm going to look at you and say, you know what? You'll find better words than this to say, you know, you were crazy the other day. <laughs> and this is how I experienced you. And we, and I, but also, because I value you, I, I want to get back to the place because it's not just about you and me. It's about creating an atmosphere of peace. It's about trying to be able to move forward in the kingdom of God. And we can't move forward in the kingdom of God if we can't be able to get past this, to get through this, to whatever. And the Bible said, and they may not like you. And they may reject you. Huh. So go home and say, I tried. No, that's not what it said. <laughs> uh, at least, Pastor, I tried. You know what I said? <laughs> I didn't cuss them out. I mean, I think I should be, I should be given some credit. You know what I'm saying? I, I know, but I'm preaching the scripture here. And so the Bible says, go find somebody. Now, not, not, this, not this anybody. Don't, fight, don't find your fighting friend. Find your praying friend, okay? Don't find somebody who is meaner than you are. And you don't know somebody that's meaner than you are. 
I love the way y'all look at me like, no, I know, Pastor. <laughs> we all know that person. Don't bring that person. Bring somebody who probably have confronted you and made you grow. Because you know they have the sincerity and skills to help you. Now you two go to them. And then you go head on. Because we're trying to create an atmosphere of peace. Because if I can reconcile the whole world, and I'm always angry at everybody, and everybody's always angry at me, guess what? I'm not walking through it. And that first amen y'all gave about walking through Jesus, now you see it coming back to bite you, right? Because if that is not who you are, you are not representing Jesus. All right. So I bring my friend, my praying friend, my friend who may have confronted with me some things, and I learned, and I bring them to you, and I talk to you, and I'm saying we want to reconcile with you. I want to say again, the one thing that definitely doesn't work that the Bible don't want you to do is to deny the conflict. It's how you move through it. And here's why the Bible is still a great book. Again, now the psychiatrist would have said that they'd be happy the first time. The religious person would have said, well, if you two have come together and you told them the truth, and now somebody else is helping them, they'll accept you. No, mm -mm, some people are not that way. Ignorance gone to seed. Y'all don't know that phrase either. There's some folk who are not ignorant, they're ignorant. They just, they just, they're just like, mm, you're just too happy to be angry all the time. And the Bible then says, you back off, you pray about it, and you come back another way. Not and I, for years, we preached, we let them go. What it means is we stop letting them hurt us, and we go back and figure out how another approach. Because peace is the important thing. Community, you'll never move as a community. You'll never become who God wants you to become if we don't at least know how to get along ourselves. And I know there are folks who are thinking right now of neighbors and friends in the middle of this sermon. They're going, he don't know what I'm dealing with. <laughs> I know you are. I know you are. I really do know you are, right? <laughs> Act like you don't. I know I did what you're talking about. I know there are. That's why the scripture is there. And the last thing it says, because we've also preached this wrong. Because have you ever heard the phrase, whatever you bound on earth, and you know, whatever you bound on earth, I bound in heaven, and, and, and I said, we, two, or two or three are gathered together and touching and agreeing on any one thing, I'll be in the midst, you heard all that. Actually, we do it all wrong because now you see the context of this word. The context of this word is when you two back off, that means you start praying for that person and start believing God for something to happen. And start thinking about God use me. Because clearly all that I am is not enough yet. Clearly there's something that I've tried hard. It's not enough yet. Clearly my, the, the, the way I'm doing it, I don't know yet. But the Bible says, but when two or three get together, I like what Mr. says, and make it a prayer. Things change. Not make it gossip. I know there ain't nobody in here. Not just talking about, I can't believe they that way. Not just make it, did you see what they did? I saw what you, um, did you see? I tell them, you know, you, you know, I, I know. I, no, that's not what will bring the change. But when two of you get together and start praying on something and make it a prayer, God says, I'll do it. I'll do it through you and in you and for you. It will not be the moment. It will not be the way. But I have the humility to let God do it, not I. There are people right now in your life that you ought to start talking about and start praying about with somebody. I love you anyway. I don't know what you're dealing with. Please, this is not me. I don't care. Do not come back to me after the service and say, you talking to me about so-and-so. I don't know. 
Okay? But you know, <laughs> and you know you need some help with that person. Because if you don't have somebody praying with you about them, your heart, they will infect you with anger. They will make you angry. You will find yourself so off in God, not because of any offense you had, you just offended that they didn't listen to you because you were all that great. You will lose your humility and therefore use your ability to work for God to work because it is an act of arrogance to believe that everybody ought to like you. I better say that again. It is an act of arrogance for everyone to say, I ought to bet everybody got to like me and you're right and everybody got to agree with me. That is what arrogance is. And that is not what God wants. But we have to work on what God wants. But I've got good news at the end of this sermon. I know it works. I know it works. And you do too. You know there are people who when you met them the first time and you had a conflict with them, you know there are people. You can not imagine you being so close to them now because you almost killed them. But because you worked through it. And you know the things when you work through something with somebody, not only do you recover your relationship, it becomes closer. And then those are the people that help you get in a relationship with someone else. We're in America, right, Mom? And I understand on the corporate level, it looks pretty impossible right now. But I'm telling you right now, I totally, 100% believe that God is still on the throne. God is still working. And we are the light of the world. We are indeed the salt of the earth. And if we stand up in faith and believe on the principles of God, we can bring the kingdom because the last thing I need to say is he, Matthew uses this title that no one else in the New Testament uses. He says it three times. The kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom of God. The word kingdom of God is used 68 times in the New Testament, 32 times in gospel alone. But the kingdom of heaven is only used three instances. The kingdom of God is God moving. The kingdom of God is Pharisees. People who think religiously they're doing what God says. But those who want to bring the kingdom of heaven are those who are not who are moving in the power of God. Those are the conduits where heaven changes things. Not just relationships, but rearranges entire atmospheres. You, I, the people of God, you're so powerful that when you open yourself up to God, heaven comes through you. And when heaven comes through you, the power of the risen God moves in you. Now, there are those who would say, well, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Because I got some seminary professors, so I have to remind them. that. But there are those who said, no, Matthew uses this very specifically. To say, if you will do this work, not only will people change, the atmosphere itself will change. You'll be peacekeepers. It's one thing. But you'll be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's you, for you shall see God. Shalom. Amen. 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 When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Can we stand and sing that? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea
with my soul. 